All right. So everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you're listening to us for the first time, you'll see the little subscribe button in the video. If you do that, it not only helps the channel, but it also helps us get this interview out to as many people as possible. And we do like to get uh, the people that do take the time out of their busy schedules to interview with us, uh, you know, that exposure as much as possible. So uh, please hit that subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to us, whether it's a podcast or it's on the YouTube. So we really appreciate that. We do have uh, Henry Gee on here. He did write a book. It is a very short history of the life on earth. So Henry, first of all, there's a lot to get through in there, but thank you for making it into a short version. And we're happy to have you on the program today. Um, you're, you're very welcome, Bob. Okay. So Henry, first of all, tell the viewers a little bit about you in general. Um, well, I, you know, you've got to ask my brain care specialist and he'll say, well, Henry's just this guy, you know, I mean, I'm about six foot tall, weigh far too much, uh, missing <laughs> most of my teeth. Uh, and I live with my family in a small seaside town in England and uh, with my family, uh, parts of them and numerous pets. Although my guinea pig did run away to join the fire brigade and my golden retriever has published her first volume of autobiography, uh, which is available, but I'm not quite sure what that's what you meant. Um, you wanted more of a resume, right? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, okay. Uh, uh, and I'm kind to animals. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was I was born um, in a trunk in the Princess Theatre in... No, I was born <laughs> under a wandering star. No, no anyway, uh, I was born in 1987 and I was educated at the University of Leeds in England in zoology and genetics. Uh, and uh, then I went to the University of Cambridge in a sort of side swerve to do a PhD in zoology, uh, which was, uh, I did, I was a paleontologist. I looked at mm. bison, bison, I was trying to tell the difference between bison and cows in the Ice Age. And if any, if you are going to ask me how you tell the difference between a buffalo and a bison, for every time anyone's asked me that, uh, if I had a pound, I'd have 857 pounds. Um, but I was coming to the end of my research and I decided I didn't want to do research anymore. I wasn't really, I didn't really have that monomaniacal concentration to sp spend a whole life working on crocodiles' eyelids or whatever. So I, um, uh, I always wanted to be a writer. I always wanted to be a journalist. I was always more interested in what everyone else was doing. I was always writing stuff for this and that. So um, uh, thanks to a concatenation of entirely unlikely events, mm -hmm. just before I finished writing up my thesis, I ended up as a junior rookie news reporter at the science journal Nature in mm -hmm. London. And, and Nature is a, a global science journal. It was founded in London mm -hmm. in 1869, but it has, you know, it goes to everyone. It's a global operation. And uh, on a three month contract, um, it's the longest three month contract anyone has ever had. So I started off writing about everything. So I had a, they wanted, a, they needed a journalist to write a science column in the London Times um, every day about science in, on the op ed page of the London Times. And the person they wanted turned them down and they had no one to fill it. Uh, and I turned up and I had no experience really whatsoever. And there I was on the op-ed page of the London Times six days a week. Um, uh, it was a bit like being, you know, picked for the you know, Manchester United after being right. seen kicking around in the backyard. So that uh, and the then editor, the marvellous John Maddox, he's since passed a long time ago, who was a marvellous mentor. He was the opposite of a micromanager. He was marvellous. Mm -hmm. He just pick people he liked and then just trusted them to get on with it. So I, I and he, if you made a few mistakes, he would pick you up and dust you off and then let you, let you go again. So he was a, and I learned very quickly how to uh, write authoritatively mm -hmm. to a deadline about something I knew nothing about. So, which is what journalists do. But of course I um, always wanted to, to write books. Um, and I, uh, 
I started to write a book on a subject that I wasn't wasn't part of my research. It was uh, about the origin of backboned animals, you know, animals with backbones. That's just like you and me and yeah. fish and chickens and things. But the origin of backboned animals is a very obscure subject. And I was a TA. I was teaching yeah. the undergraduates at Cambridge and I wished I'd had a book to teach them. So after finishing my thesis, I went and wrote a book called Before the Backbone, which is a very strange book. It's uh, it's um, still in print, believe it or not. Occasionally, someone is daft enough to buy a copy at about 130 quid, but you know, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but also, while I was at Nature, I moved to the team of people, of ex lab rats who select the actual scientific research we publish. So in nature, there's a news team who do the science news, the policy news and the features. And then there's the team, you know, in the back room that selects the science that people send in. Mm -hmm. So every year, every year, nature gets 10, 15, 20,000 new submissions. And from that, we select five to 7%, no, I don't know, 500 to 700. Uh, a year and I joined that team mm. actually I'd, I'd applied to that team before and got rejected they they hired someone else but then uh, they um, I said to them can I just come and ha do some pa handle the paleontology for you mm -hmm. and they said great because we we don't like paleontology very much and we need someone to handle it so they threw me a few bones right. and then in course of time I got to handle all the evolutionary biology and I was still writing for the for the you know science the, the science wing and I was still writing I started to write more popular books and um uh and the time passed and now a third of a century later here I am still at nature um I'm now one of the old geezers you know my my most of my colleagues weren't born when I joined nature um, but they've all got postdocs and things I mean where does the time go yeah. uh, and, and I wrote a, I wrote a number of books and you know I did a new book on my origin of vertebrates there we are it's called across the bridge mm -hmm. I didn't want to write one but I turn it turns out that when you write things things go into the ether and you're no longer responsible for them and it turned out that young scientists that I knew yeah. had actually read my first book and were inspired to go into science because of it i was amazed i didn't know that until quite recently and so various scientists were trying to get me to write an update of my vertebrate origins book and i kept so i kept finding an excuse but then three of them got me in a room with my publisher and i ran out of excuses so i had to write that uh but i also wrote a popular book called um the Accidental Species, Misunderstandings of Human Evolution, uh, which is uh, much a much nicer read. Um, and then, of course, I wrote this one, which is the one that we where you want to hear about, A Very Short History of Life on Earth. So uh, that's the latest thing. I've got a few. I've got a few projects bubbling under, um, but that's that's me have I I've got anything to declare war um socks uh my genius um uh no officer I put my fist out in his face for it it fell on it oh anyway so that's me <laughs> so let's <laughs> thank you very much for going into that so I, I do want to talk about this Henry because there's so much to really divulge I mean the world is always evolving around us species are getting extinct every day, unfortunately, be due to uh, the climate and the global warming in general. So can you talk about this book in general? What made you want to write this book? And I'm sh obviously it's evolving since you even wrote mm, it. Because, it is, yeah, it is. Yeah. New things are being found. Uh, there are, you know, uh, what I did was um, I, at the back of my mind, I've always wanted to write a book um, on the life on life on earth on the history of life on earth but it was never a very uh evolved idea i'd usually think about it while walking the dogs you know when you think about things and uh but it got put back up in the back of my mind you know my mind is like a shed and at the back is the old garden furniture and the barbecue and those 
that that strange thing that granny gave you that you don't dare th throw out and all sorts of lumber and and junk so it stuck there until um it was sparked into life by a colleague of mine at nature called david adam uh mm. he's moved on since he was a new he, news writer and also a book writer and we would get together and talk about books and he said why don't you henry write about all those amazing fossil finds that you henry have been responsible for publishing and giving to the world in my time at nature the amazing fisher pods of neil shubin and the little tiny hobbit creatures and feathered dinosaurs and so on and i thought that was a very good idea although i did protest strongly that i wasn't going to write another book because every time i write a book i say i'm not going to write another book and my wife smiles at me indulgently and says yes dear of course you aren't um so i went away and wrote the book um and of course it, it came out as quite a simple linear story it didn't start like that um there were all kinds of twos and fro's and uh, thanks to my marvellous agent who stuck by me since the last millennium, bless her, um, we got this killer synopsis that publishers seem to be falling falling over themselves for, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and the rest is prehistory. So that's how I got the idea. It's not an idea that is unique. Every so often someone comes up with an idea uh, like this. Um, I'm trying to... Find, there's a, a, a chap in Oxford called um, Tom Halliday who's written a lovely book called Other Lands that's sort of a bit like mine, but it's more literary and has longer words. And, uh, and uh, Professor Andrew Knoll has written a, from Harvard has written one, but that's more geological rather than life. Um, and I was actually, when thinking about it, I was actually inspired by the great Sir David Attenborough the veteran BBC wildlife documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Now he's still making documentaries, even though he's in his nineties, but in the, in the 1970s, when I was an impressionable teenager thinking about where I was going to go, what I was going to do, he did the most amazing documentary called life on earth. Yeah. Um, and it was the one You'll have probably seen bits about it at the end. He's got he's standing in front of some a family of mountain gorillas speaking very quietly. Um, that's the bit everyone remembers. But he was it was a great sweep all the way through life on Earth, um, and it was magisterial and vast and just a sweeping and had fantastic music. And I still remember how gripped I was, age fifteen or sixteen. And a lot of people of my generation um, were gripped. And in fact, when I left school and went to college at the University of Leeds, we were shown episodes of Life on Earth as kind of introductory material because it was popular television, but seen as, you know, the latest cutting edge. So in my heart, that's what really drove me. I wanted to, um, I wanted to do Life on Earth, but like as a novel, uh, like as a story it starts once upon a time um and the great thing as uh, what the the science fiction writer ian m banks once said that as a writer rather than the filmmaker you have an unlimited special effects budget so hey if you want an asteroid hitting the earth you just write it asteroid hit the earth or volcanoes or if dinosaurs stomping around and uh, birds flying through the air you just write it so um, as I wrote it, I realised that it's just a thumping good story. It's got characters and narrative arcs and cliffhangers and um, uh, that you could end chapters with and uh, a hopeful, hopeful signs. But what I did, which I think was unique, uh, there are two things about it. One is it's unique, and that's also the second thing, is that I actually add a free billion years at the end. Um, although it says um, 4.6 billion years, I add another billion, which you get for free. So normally when these books finish, they finish with the modern day, with uh, us living on the earth. But then I thought in the great scheme of things, humans have, you know, arrive on the earth and then will disappear again at some point. And I didn't want to have, I'm talking about the whole history of life on earth. I'm not talking about the history of just us. 
So I didn't want to have that as a privileged point. I wanted to carry on and think about what life would be like in the future until it becomes extinct. So uh, using a, you know, some my background in science and reading up and also my interest in science fiction, I, um, I did a chapter called The Past of the Future. So I talk about, you know, what's going to happen on the earth until, uh, until it dies out in about a billion years time. Um, uh, so it reads like a story, but it's very short. It's just over 200 pages long. And there are a few more pages because I've got a lot of notes and references and further reading. So if anybody wants to find out how I know all this stuff, they can go and look it up because it's all in the, in the notes. But I've written it so that you can just read it through without reading the notes because it's meant to be fun. It's not meant to be a a textbook although it is probably going to be good for uh students in what they call dinosaurs 101 and i think if you're a student and you're watching this it will do half your assignments for you so really you should buy two copies <laughs> uh and uh uh so it's a story but it's to, to the best of my knowledge up to date but as you said science is always evolving and there are two or three papers that came out and in, indeed past my desk at nature that have since been published that if i'd known about it i would have added in mm -hmm. but that's great that's the way science happens there's a lot more in there than david attenborough even dreamed of you know 50 years ago when he did life on earth um and there that's how i got to do it and uh, that's that's how it happened and um a lot of people seem to like it which is very nice Right. And, and I want to get into this because, you know, you just spoke about how, you know, stuff is still changing. Now, my question is, and we got this as an audience question is, you know, we, I kind of briefly introduced the global warming climate change. We're seeing that all over Europe, all over the U.S., Canada, everywhere in general, even Brazil uh, with the Amazon rainforest being cut down and how that's going to affect the planet in general, not just Brazil. So when you speak about, you know, the chapter you wrote about how you believe that Earth is going to, you know, keep going and then it will become extinct, do you feel like due to these changes that are man-made that we're doing personally it's going to come faster than you know later on in you know history now there are a couple of things here one is that the climate has always changed right. i mean at various times in the earth's history it's been a ball of molten rock it's been a complete ocean of water it's been covered in ice miles thick and it's been a jungle from pole to pole and so the climate is always changing. Sometimes there's been more carbon dioxide, sometimes there's been less, sometimes there's been more oxygen, sometimes there's been less. Um, so that's one thing. So that's perspective. So you might ask, why are people making a fuss about climate change that is caused by humans? Now, I have to say, yes, there is climate change and yes, it is caused by humans. Um, so let's get that out of the way. Um, uh, but there's... Um, one thing that humans do that no other creature has done as far as we know although i suspect the crows is that they are actually conscious of what they are doing now yeah. two and two and a half no two and a half three three and a half billion years ago um uh, some bacteria came across the handy trick of using sunlight to split water into hydrogen and oxygen uh and created the process called photosynthesis which is the process that plants use they this amazing trick that plants combine carbon dioxide and water and sunlight and make sugars and food out i mean it's just amazing but they produced a byproduct which is oxygen now at the time life had largely evolved in the absence of oxygen and it was a lethal poison so um uh, that was the first mass extinction you know three billion years ago or so was the production of oxygen so, but those poor little bacteria didn't know they were doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but we do know we're doing it. We're quite conscious that we're doing it. And we are actually taking steps to stop it. Now, what you do find is climate change is happening astonishingly fast. And uh, there is a good reason for that is that um, 
people have been pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere over a very short time scale. And by short, I mean 200, 250 mm. years, which is you know, since the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Um, all the coal uh, that ever was made on Earth, um, most of it was formed in a 70 million year period during the period of the Great Coal Forest. And we've dug up that and have been burning a lot of it. So all that carbon that was locked up over 70 million years has been suddenly injected into the atmosphere. Well, people are starting not to use coal, um, but people are still using petroleum, which accumulated over different periods. Um, and it's been injected into the atmosphere over a very short time. And what that does is it destabilizes the atmosphere. Now, a very recent example was something called the jet stream. Now, the jet stream is a wind in the upper atmosphere that goes from west to east. So if you're flying from England to the States, it mm. always takes a long time because you're flying into the wind. But if you're flying from the States to England, it takes one or two hours less because you're being blown by the jet stream. Um, but what happens, the jet stream depends, I hope you're taking all this in, there's gonna be a quiz afterwards. I hope you're taking this in, uh, the, the jet stream depends on a contrast in temperature. It, 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 require, it, it relies on the tropics being hot and the North Pole being cold. And that keeps it in a nice line. But the poles, because of global warming, are warming up much faster than the tropics. So the, the difference in temperature is much less. And what happens is the jet stream goes all over the place. It doesn't know what to do, which means when the jet stream goes too far north, you get wildfires and tropical heat in British Columbia. And if it goes too far south, you get snow in Texas, um, floods everywhere. Um, and this is a very dramatic example of recent uh, climate change. Now, um, I'm not one of the people who goes around saying save the planet because the planet doesn't matter what we need to save is ourselves uh, uh the world will change the world's always got to change but what we have to do is to try our best to mitigate the problem uh, uh and uh do so soon but it's not true to say that politicians are, and people in general are doing nothing about it because they are and it's been happening over quite a long time um uh the world population growth was very fast in the, you know, the population was a quarter what it, what it is now in my grandparents' day. You look like a young fellow. I mean, I'm nearly 60 and it was half what it was when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, Paul Ehrlich wrote the population bomb mm -hmm. and said, we're all going to starve because there are going to be too many people. And that was, say, 1968. Mm. And, and in that time, that was um, quite a valid argument because the world population was increasing at, one, at over 2% a year, the whole population. Um, but then a number of things happened. There was the Green Revolution, where people in the States and the Philippines uh, grew uh, more higher yielding rice and wheat. It's called the Green Revolution. That, so now we can support much more people in... Uh, ease and comfort and comparatively people are better off than they were you know yeah. talking really broad brush and the population right. growth has gone down to 1.3 percent um and uh the end of the century it will you know towards the end of the century it will level out and start to come down um mm. and my prediction is that human beings will become extinct in the next few hundred years um wow. it, uh, you see but the thing is Humans are an old species because we have kind of interfered with the program, as it were, rather than just going with the flow, as all creatures do. We could go on for millions of years or we could suddenly end next Tuesday. Uh, but what happens is because we're large animals and there are lots of us all of a sudden, we've used up all the resources. Um, and I think that's one reason why the po why is the population slowing now rather than at any other time? And I think that's because we've largely used up the easily findable resources that we have. And um, this is, I think, what a re reason why people are marrying later, people are having fewer children. Right. And that goes along with the climate deterioration. I mean, anyway, there we are.
No, no, I agree with you 100%. I, I think it is an issue. And there are some people, like you said, Henry, that are doing some things about it. But there's a lot of people and, you know, that like the U.S. Uh, military, that they, <laughs> their carbon that they excrete every year is like half the world's carbon. Well, uh, you along know. Along with China, yeah. Yeah, well, people are beginning to do things, although you don't notice it. Um, there are a lot of tiny things that people have changed. Now, when I was a kid and I went to college, we used to take armfuls of LPs and huge, great stereo systems and, you know, computers and uh, great big electrically consuming items. But now when my kids go to college, they take one of these. That's got everything. You know, my kids look at CDs yeah. now and say, what's that? That's a sort of antique thing. Um, and uh, uh, people are... Um, uh, people are um, people no longer drive those great big gas guzzling cars, you know, with engines at both ends. You, you know the ones I mean. Even in yeah. the states, people drive. I mean, people still drive SUVs and compacts, but they don't drive these enormous cars generally because they cost too much to run. They're leaky. They require servicing. I mean, you know, back in my day, my dad had the hood up of the car and was fixing things. Now you don't even look at it. And cars right. these days, cars these days are Computers. much more, yeah, they're much more fuel efficient. They have a little computer in there working it out. And quite soon, the internal combustion engine will be extinct. Yeah. Now, that was only invented in 1876. The term, it, it's not like it's been there forever. It's mm. only been there for 100, 120, 130 years by Mr. Daimler and Mr. Ben said, ah, we shall invent the internal combustion engine and cause a great deal of pollution in the earth and deal without horses and their poo. So <laughs> they, they invented that. And now the internal combustion engine has caused, causes a lot of carbon. But now, you know, you know this in the world, you know, California and many states and certainly in Britain have made a commitment to phase out, yeah. you know, gas uh, cars altogether and get powered by electricity. So within 30 years, maybe less, the uh, internal combustion engine, which causes so much pollution, not just, you know, hydrocarbons, but particulates and, you know, other nitrogen oxides and things, that will be as antique as manual typewriters. Uh, now, when I started work, we still had manual typewriters. We were going on to electronic typewriters, let alone didn't have computers. Right. Um, so, uh, so these are things. And also, now, there's another thing about energy consumption in the world, how much energy each of us uses. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, that's called per capita energy consumption. Mm -hmm. That's how much each person uses. Now, in the world as a whole, it's still going up because there are people in, you know, China and India and Africa who are getting more affluent and they use more energy. However, in the US and the UK and what we patronizingly call the developed world, it's actually going down and it's been going down for 50 years. There was a statistic I found which amazed me was just in the, in the UK to take one very highly surveyed developed economy, per capita energy consumption has decreased by a fifth in 20 years since mm. the year 2000. That's yeah, but astonishing. isn't the problem though, Henry, in places like Africa with all these countries and they're starting to gain wealth uh, and, you know, the population boom is going to be in Africa because yeah, of the it birth is, it is all, yeah. Well, people, because it, it's because people are younger, because the right. populations are younger. Um, in many countries, the populations are older and not having so many kids. But the thing in Africa, there are two things in Africa. One is Africans export their people elsewhere. Because of climate change in the Sahara, there's a great deal of migration to the north because of economic migration. And uh, great, you know, warm, uh, uh, warmth, lack of governance, lack of stability leads to inter, inter nissan conflict, so they're refugees. Um, also, traditional modes of land use in parts of Africa tend to divide and subdivide and subdivide plots between children. So mm. eventually they have nothing to subsist on them. There was one analysis that showed that the genocide in Rwanda mm. was actually fundamentally caused by that traditional land holding. But people are waking up to the fact that they can't do that anymore. Mm. Also, uh, um, what's happening in what we patronizingly call the developing world is they're short-circuiting 
they're go they're skipping out the heavy industry the smokestack industries and going straight to the 21st century so you know this is why you have a country like nigeria you know suit one of the most populous places on the planet that is absolutely full of people with mobile phones that they they don't have a real they don't and this is what i found when i went to mexico in 94 you know, people don't really pay much use to their regular like bell telephone system because the infrastructure is terrible so they go straight to the internet and straight to mobile phones and also a number of things that's happening is and, and this is the biggest factor in the past hundred years mm -hmm. is the emancipation of women now even in the west in the developed nations women had no vote until a hundred years ago uh uh, and now even in uh what again what we patronizingly call the developing world women do have the vote they have governance over their own reproduction they take part in the workforce and in politics and the effect of that has improved everybody's lives um you know according to the un sustainable development goals uh there are now um just about one in two people in the world complete primary you know elementary education uh and it used to be much less than that and now it's one in two and people are now now they're concentrating on people um finishing you know uh the the next level of education you know going all the way through from k-12 and this is happening in all parts of the world and because of the emancipation of women people are taking more conscious decisions about their reproduction and this also applies in africa um so uh the, the the population is booming in africa because people are young it's not because they're 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 not caring about the planet it's because people tend to have babies when they're younger it's just right. what people do so so uh the, the 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 population boom in africa will subside it will just take a little longer than the rest of the rest of the world where the population boom has is over and in some places like japan and italy it's crashing uh you know they're, they're soon going to be uh you know some countries are dying from lack of people so uh japan is a big problem um japan has a, a has you know a very very low birth rate um but is also very resistant to uh immigration from other places so they've got a, a big problem in who's going to pay for all these old people um and uh so that you know when you come to you know the states or the us you find a lot of people doing jobs are people who've come from somewhere else mm -hmm. now uh in in uh in britain we've got a problem because we've just left the european union so um all the people who came from the european union are now going back home again now, partly because we've left but also because the, the economists back home are doing better um and in the us there are lots of immigrant people from other countries all over the world who are doing the essential jobs that everyone needs to keep the whole edifice mm -hmm going over now in britain we have this amazing thing called the national health service which is this right. huge gargantuan labor labyrinthine monster of a service that um is the largest employer in europe not mm -hmm. just britain in europe it consumes wow. a huge wedge of our public funds but it's largely run by people from other countries you know you can you know my wife is a nurse you go into the there and everyone's from nigeria or india or sri lanka or you know poland or somewhere so it's like the united nations so i'm I, the thing is rob what you've got to do is you have to stop me because i will go on and on and <laughs> on and on and on and on and on and on until physically restrained this is why having Zoom meetings is brilliant because they can't do it. They can't <laughs> actually come over and. <laughs> the guy in the back room comes out and <laughs> just restrains he come, you. Yeah, he comes around, <laughs> hits me over the head with a slice of lemon wrapped around a gold brick. Yeah. No, this is interesting. I, I mean, I love this topic. I know this is a little bit off from the book, but uh, we'll go no, back. I've, and... been, I've been thinking of it later, and you know, I'm. There may be another book in this but i'm i'm still as you see i'm in my secret underground lair underneath an extinct volcano although i don't have the white cat and so i can say so mr bond we meet at last um and but i've been plotting and scheming further <laughs> attempts at world domination 
<laughs> well, I mean, there's so many things I could stay, say back <laughs> to what we were just talking about, because I agree with you. Uh, I think, um, you know, we think of, you know, obviously the U.S. and China. And I know the China one child policy really hurt them for quite a while. It's still hurting them now. You know, they went away from that a little bit. Uh, but I mean, we could go into that. We'd be talking about this stuff for, for hours. But um, and, and I think we could, you know, do, definitely do this interview again. But I do want to finish on the book. So what do you hope people learn from the book? A sense of perspective. Yeah. But we are we are just a tiny dot in the whole amazing panoply of life on Earth. However, that's not a reason for despair. Um, you know, even even though we are just here and gone, we can do a lot of things to make our life tolerable and more pleasant while we are here. Mm -hmm. um, because the history of life is long. Uh, it's so long that it's very, very difficult to express. I mean, billions and billions of years. What does it actually mean? And I've tried to do that with various timelines in the book uh, uh, to show. But it's just such a, a magnificent story so the first thing apart from what we've just talked about is that you know i said that people get a sense of perspective i hope that's more of a kind of aftertaste what i hope they do is enjoy it as a good read because i wrote it as a story uh it's uh, i wrote it to be enjoyed uh, uh, as well as to be instructive um but i suppose any good story's got some kind of has layers and moral dimensions but I just mm. wrote it because you know I, I wrote it like a novel I wrote it as a page turner and in the in the um in in the US in the UK it's quite a great big book like that but in the US they've managed to make it smaller it's got all this is the US one there you will and it's so, <laughs> it's so small that you could fit it in an inside pocket and yeah. take it with you wherever you go I mean, there is a, you know, an e-book version and uh, there's also an audio book versions, which I narrated. I did all the music at my studio, Flabby Road. Most people hate the music. Um, they like the narration. Um, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I hope the main people, the main thing uh, people uh, will get from it is that they will enjoy it as a story. Uh, and that's what I hope they'll do. Where can people get the book? as far as that goes and as far as social media websites how can they find more about you well uh the book i will remind you once again is a very short history of life on earth 4.6 billion years in 12 pithy chapters don't say pithy too much if you have loose teeth like i do uh it's on it's in all good bookstores it's on all the websites it's all over the internet like a cheap suit I have a website devoted to the book called a very short history of life on earth dot com. Um, and you can find it there. You can find me on Facebook, Henry G. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at end of the pier because I live in a seaside town. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram, Henry G 22. Um, and uh, but basically you find more than you'd possibly want to know at a very short history of life on earth.com uh, and i list on that all the reviews um all the places you can buy it all the translations it's in um all the podcasts all the media uh and um, all the uh, voluntary organizations that will help you rehabilitate after you've read my book and um uh, everything that you could uh, and there's all about me and uh, uh, and um, I encourage you to visit it. I'm updating it all the time because I've got nothing better to do at the moment. And uh, um, and there you are. And it's been a pleasure to talk, Rob. And um, don't forget the fire. Why do they call you fire breathing, Rob? Uh, well, it goes it back. You like Scotch bonnet chilies and breathe them over everyone. It goes back to a couple of radio shows I used to be on. Uh, and they used to, uh, the callers used to call me because uh, I used to, we used to hoot and holler and yell and scream at each other. So, oh, so, so you, were a, you were a shock jock. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah, well, somewhat of, you know. Yeah, nah, nah. 
now now big bad bill is sweet william now yeah you yeah, ma- ma- calm down a bit yeah, yeah now I we are very low i was gonna say lay off lay off the hot sauce for a bit that's what i'd say you know. yeah, now we're very low-key and informative yeah. now yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but anyways and, uh, henry i appreciate you coming on yeah, yeah and, it's, uh, it's a pleasure so I'm sorry it's been quite a uh, it's it's been quite difficult to schedule but we're here now yeah, yeah. we're here now